Thank you, Daniela, for that. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship at Stony Brook Online. I am so grateful that we can be together virtually, even as we continue to be distanced physically. My name is Maureen Shaman, and I'm very pleased to serve as worship associate this morning for Michelle Massimo and Maria Cotta. Michelle and Maria are members of our fellowship who had hoped to share in person in our sanctuary both their path to veganism as a spiritual practice and some homemade vegan treats, but they are content to speak from their separate homes and to offer you some of their recipes. Our minister, currently on her summer study leave, is Margie Allen, and our director of religious education is Deborah Little. These are trying times for us all. Way too many lives have been lost to the virus and to systemic racism and violence in all forms. We come together to find a sense of community for healing and for hope. May our challenges lead to a collective resolve to be more compassionate stewards for our planet and to each other. I'd like to offer a special welcome to anyone new to our fellowship. Our services vary in style and content, and we hope you will visit us more than once to get a true sense of who we are as a community of faith. Unitarian Universalism is a free religion with no fixed creed that everyone must accept. We are guided by our seven principles and many sources of inspiration. You will find information about these on our webpage, uufsb.org. At the conclusion of our morning service, we will have a virtual virtual coffee hour. It will take a few minutes for everyone to be admitted into the full gathering with active video and audio, so please be patient while our tech team accomplishes this. Following this, there will be an opportunity to meet with others in a small group chat. You will need to leave this meeting in order to do that. Please check the special news feed sent yesterday or uufsb.org for the link to that meeting. The children's worship circle is on summer break and will resume in September. Whoever you are, whether you are bored or exhausted, hopeful or terrified, lifelong UU or curious spectator, you are welcome here. I invite you to light a candle when I light my chalice and encourage you to sing along with the hymns, knowing we are all singing together and imagining all of our voices lifted together in song. The fellowship has left the building but we are still together, still here for each other and for you. I invite you now into sacred space and time with the sounding of the morning bell. I invite you to light your own candle or chalice as I light this one and read the chalice lighting by Mark Causey. We light this chalice, spark of all creation, to remind us that we all on this planet, the furred, the feathered, the finned, and the scaled, along with us featherless bipeds, we are all made of the same star stuff and all share a common destiny. We all share the same hopes of a life free from harm and suffering and the same aspirations of happiness, love and flourishing, being able to express our own unique natures and capacities as best we may. We are just that many diverse perspectives from which the whole is seen and experienced. We are inextricably intertwined interconnected and interdependent, and it is good. Blessed be. Vincent Schilling, an indigenous people's writer for Indian Country Today writes, without a doubt, animals are a huge part of native culture. They are considered our brothers and sisters among our four-legged and swimming family members. They are part of our creation stories. They are messengers to the ancestors and the creator, and they are our teachers on this world. According to the Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader of the Tibetan Buddhism, people have to learn to think about animals in a different way. 
as sentient beings who love life and fear death. I urge everyone who can to adopt a compassionate vegetarian lifestyle. Buddhist writer Suresh Jindal says, once we experience and feel this interdependence of all living beings, we will cease to hurt, humiliate, exploit, and or kill another. We want to free all sentient beings from suffering. This is karuna, or compassion, which in turn gives rise to responsibility to create happiness and its causes for all. The Hindu lawyer who led the Indian subcontinent to freedom, Mahatma Gandhi said, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. To my mind, the life of a lamb is no less precious than that of a human being. Please join us in singing hymn number 203, All Creatures of the Earth and Sky. We will sing the first three verses. meditation this morning, we will, be, we, we will begin with the responsive reading number 550, We Belong to the Earth, words attributed to Chief Noah Sell. I will read the regular type and I invite you to read along with Maria the type in bold italics. This we know, excuse me, this we know, the earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. This we know. All things are connected like the blood which unites one family. All things are connected. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons and daughters of the earth. We did not weave this web of life. We are merely a strand in it. Whatever we do to the web we do to ourselves. During the silence, we invite you to think of a time when you connected with an animal. What did it feel like? What did you see? What did you notice about that animal? After the silence, Daniela and Ariana will lead us in a chant, and I hope you will sing along.
Thank you very much, Daniela and Ariana. That was beautiful. One purpose of the fellowship is to encourage all who gather here to grow more generous in spirit and in action. We now take an offering that allows us to exercise that all important generosity of spirit. The circumstances caused by the COVID pandemic have put many people in a condition of food insecurity. In response, our social action committee has chosen to make this our share the plate focus through August. The shared portion will be divided 80% to Island Heart Food Pantry and 20% to our members in need. During this period when we are not able to meet in person, please continue to send in your pledge payments and your contributions for our Share the Plate partners. Details on how to make contributions are found in the special news feed or you can go to uufsb.org right now. In any case, please remember to to instruct the office how you want your gift to be designated. If you donate online, be sure to add a note. The gifts of the congregation will be most gratefully received. and savage and you've been so many places I guess it must be so but still I cannot see if the savage one is me how can there be so much that you don't know you don't know The earth is just a dead thing you can claim But I know every rock and tree and creature Has a life, has a spirit, has a name You think the only people who are people Are the people who look and think like you But if you walk the footsteps of a stranger You'll learn things you never knew, you never knew. Have you ever heard the wolf cry to the blue corn moon? Or ask the grinning bobcat why he grins? Can you sing with all the voices of the mountain? Can you paint with all the colors of the wind? Can you paint with all the colors of the wind? Come run the hidden pine trails of the forest. Come taste the sun sweet berries of the earth. Come roll in all the riches all around you. And for once, never wonder what they're worth. The rainstorm and the river are my brothers. The heaven and the ardor are my friends. And we are all connected to each other in a circle, in a hoop that never ends. How high does a sycamore grow if you cut it down? Then you'll never. of the wind you can own the earth and still all you'll own is earth until you can paint with all the colors of the wind
When I was five, my mother told me she wanted me to help her pick out a chicken. I was filled with joy at the prospect of getting a chicken as a pet. We arrived at the market and I surveyed the scurrying flock. I pointed to a beautiful beige speckled hen. Then to my horror, a bloody aproned burly man snatched up my chicken, lopped off her head, and attached her to a machine which ripped out her feathers. Off she went onto a conveyor belt. The next time I saw my pet, she was wrapped neatly in brown paper and tied with string. As I walked with my mother to the elevated train line, my mind was seared with the weight of what I had wrought upon my beautiful chicken. I vowed never to eat meat again, but as a five-year-old, my conviction had little staying power. Another vivid childhood memory on my journey to the my food comes from animals connection is of a family get vacation to storybook land, still operating and making memories since 1955. My sister and I entered Bo Peep's enclosure. Miss Peep, Miss Peep's little lamb took an immediate shine to me as I to him. Our parents beckoned us to move on to the next story, but I held my lamb closely, kissing his woolly little head. As I turned to open the gate, my lamb bolted after me and I just knew I had to take him home with me to our apartment in the South Bronx. After much cajoling from my parents and tears from me, I left my little lamb behind. A short time passed and soon it was Easter. And as was customary in our Italian American household, Easter dinner was lamb. My heart and my mind reeled again as I made the connection between an animal's life being taken for the sake of a meal for me. Still, my attempt to abstain from meat was no more successful than the last. Once I was away from home and at college in 1972, I joined the Stony Brook University Food Co-op. I dove headfirst into vegetarianism. Of course, my goal was focused more on staving off the freshman 15 than on my spiritual belief, though I did realize that meat animals were increasingly factory farmed and led lives of deprivation, isolation, and suffering. Back then, being a vegetarian consisted mostly of tofu and broccoli with a heavy emphasis on ramen and PB&J sandwiches. It was very difficult to maintain a veggie lifestyle in the 70s, 80s, and the early 1990s, but I did my best. When I joined an evangelical church in 2000, I began poring over the Bible to find scriptures which validated my passion for animals and my plant-based diet. I found the Old and New Testaments filled with passages which spoke clearly that the original intent and plan for humankind was to live with compassion, empathy, and mercy for all living creatures. According to Genesis 129, God said, I give you every seed and fruit bearing plant, they will be for your for yours, they will be yours for food. And all the beasts and birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the earth, everything that has breath shall have every green plant for food. Proverbs 12.10 speaks of a righteous person caring for their animals. Matthew 10.29 states that not one sparrow falls to the ground without, your, without God's concern. In Luke 14.5, Jesus speaks of finding your child or your ox fallen into a ditch on the Sabbath day, yet you would rescue either one. In the book of Daniel, we read how Daniel ate vegetables only, and refused to defile himself with the rich meats of the king, and yet was found to be healthier than all the king's servants. One would think that this biblical evidence would be enthusiastically embraced within my religious community. Nothing could be further from reality. My fellow believers cited these other scriptures these and other scriptures to validate the patriarchal worldview of man's dominion over the animals and man's right to subdue the animals and the earth. 
This view stressed man's use of animals within the privileged place of dominion. I fought an uphill battle attempting to advocate for at least an occasional plant-based coffee hour, citing stewardship rather than dominion. I grew into my veganism as a soul felt heart decision and found myself drawing away from my fellow congregants. To me, speciesism felt no different than racism, misogyny, or homophobia. To me, all, uh, excuse me, all of which I knew many evangelicals had found scriptural evidence to justify. Mercy and compassion towards animals is not a separate consideration from ethics towards humans. There have also been health benefits from my veganism. Unlike other vegans who have had lifelong aversion to meat and dairy, I had a lifelong struggle with my ethics and my compulsive eating behavior. Eventually, I came to see that being a foodie and being a vegan are not mutually exclusive. But for me, veganism runs deeper than health. When I finally left the evangelical church I'd been attending and walked through the doors of UUFSB's Green Sanctuary, my spirit felt at home at last. I joined with others reading the seven principles aloud. The words jumped off the page. At last, my spirit's convictions were no longer an asterisk or a footnote, which I had to justify. Here at UUFSB, there was a truth, there was the truth in black and white. Principle six states that we covenant to affirm and promote the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And principle seven, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. My veganism was accepted. There were no qualifiers or asterisks which I had to explain or justify. There is only this spirit of life found here in an all-encompassing acceptance within a community of faith. Most, if not all, of the world's religions, both Western and Eastern, have something to say about the importance of treating animals with kindness. I mentioned earlier several passages from the Judeo-Christian Testaments. In Hebrew, the word for soul or living being is nefesh, and it is used for human beings and animals interchangeably within the Torah. Islam forbids treating animals cruelly, and Hadith instructs that Kindness and mercy to animals is likened to kindness and mercy to humans. According to the Quran, the prophet Muhammad believed that since animals cannot speak for themselves, we as humans must show mercy. Both Judaism and Islam have strict rules for how and when its adherents may or may not eat meat, what kind of meat may or may not be eaten, and how animals raised for meat must be treated when raised and when killed. Buddhism and Hinduism have even stronger, more central tenets regarding compassion for all living beings. And many, though not all, adherents of these religions are vegetarian. In one sutra, the Buddha says that eating meat destroys compassion. And Buddhists in China, Vietnam, and other industrialized nations tend to be vegetarians. Some Hindus, like Gandhi, are vegetarians because it minimizes hurting other life forms. As for me, I agree with Gandhi that the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way it treats its animals. To my mind, the life of a lamb is no less precious than that of a human being. As a teenager, I remember feeling uncomfortable by the sight of blood or veins or fat in the roast beef that I used to eat. Once I learned that not eating meat was an option, I became a vegetarian at 16. I'd love to say that I was an evolved teen who did it to save the animals or for the environment, but in the words of my teenage self, meat just simply grossed me out. My mom was supportive and made sure I always had plenty of food to eat. Other relatives used to comment that it was just a phase 
and that I would grow out of because you need to eat meat. During my college years, I joined an environmental and public interest research group called NIPER and Syracuse University for Animal Rights, where I learned about the atrocities of animal cruelty related to the meat and fur industries. I remember being glad that by being vegetarian, I was not participating in supporting such, pra such practices. In my mid-20s, while living in San Francisco, I visited an interactive science museum. There, I looked through microscopes at a life cycle exhibit that followed the fertilization and growth of a chick. The moment I saw the little embryo through the microscope, I was horrified and saddened. I connected it to the unfertilized little white dot that I would sometimes see after cracking an egg to cook. For whatever reason, I had never made that connection as deeply before. And so I began limiting my egg consumption. In my late 20s, I learned more about the dairy industry and the effects of dairy consumption in Mary Lou Henner's book, Total Health Makeover. Then came the fateful evening when I read the ingredients of grated cheese and on the list was animal rennet. I ran to the dictionary for the definition of rennet, the inner lining of a calf's stomach. Once again, I had my grossed out feeling and that was the end of cheese for me. This moment also highlighted my sensitivity to eating animal products as Pete, unaffected by the news, said, pass the cheese, and carried on with dinner. In my early 30s, I had to educate myself about healthy vegan nutrition in pregnancy, and then how to raise healthy vegan children. Learning about the health benefits of a vegan diet was affirming for me and strengthened my commitment. Soon after that, we came to the UUFSB, and I was comforted by people's acceptance and support of our food choices, as well as a principle citing respect for the interdependent web of life. As part of our work to become a green sanctuary, I joined the Committee on Ethical Eating and, was, and conducted a service with Stephanie Scott and others. I learned more about the environmental benefits of a vegan diet, and was happy to sort up, support others as they leaned into vegetarianism. Throughout the years, there were hints that my food choice carried a spiritual component, but it wasn't until I learned the Sanskrit term, ahimsa, during yoga classes that I made the deep connection. In the Buddhist, Hindu, and Jainist traditions, ahimsa means non-harming as part of a spiritual practice. Wow, so now, that choice, that grossed out teenage choice, that choice that had been validated over many years was now being validated again and now on a spiritual level? Whoa, for me, knowing that I was doing my part to protect animals, save the environment, and benefit my health was validating enough. But now taking it to a level of spiritual practice was for me the deepest most meaningful, most impactful reason that I continue to live a vegan lifestyle. I learned a version of the Buddhist metta prayer. May all beings be peaceful. May all beings be happy. May all beings be safe. May all beings awaken to the light of their true nature. May all beings be free. And I learned the Sanskrit chant, Loka, Samasta, Sukhino, Bhavantu. May all beings be happy and free. And may the thoughts, words, and actions of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and freedom for all. As a Unitarian Universalist, I carry a deep respect for the interdependent web of life of which we are all a part, and I value the inherent worth and dignity of all beings, both human and non-human. This includes all animals, not just the ones who become our companions, but also the snorting, muddy, 
highly intelligent pigs, the grazing cows, the pecking chickens, the majestic turkeys, the wild deer, and my favorite, our next of kin, the monkeys and apes. I do wonder why some have been deemed acceptable as food while others are protected, but that's for another service. I believe that, our, that the energy we feel toward other living creatures carries a ripple effect out into the world and the universe and comes back to us. What energy do I want to send out there? I personally cannot justify the suffering of another being for my benefit, especially when that benefit is not necessary to my well being. It is important to me to not contribute to the pain and suffering of other beings, and it is just as important to me to not ingest the energy of that pain and suffering. At the same time, it is equally important to me to support all people in their journeys and personal choices. I never force my beliefs or food choices on others. I do not judge other choice, others' choices. That would be in direct conflict with the practice of ahimsa, in my opinion. However, as I learn more, I speak up more on behalf of the animals, and I serve to support others who are interested in transitioning to a more plant-based, cruelty-free way, cruelty -free way of eating. I was so happy to learn recently about the Unitarian Universalist Animal Ministry, whose mission it is to empower individuals, chapters, and congregations to build justice and compassion for animals. They, quote, offer that human beings are only a strand in the intricate web of life. Recognizing the beauty and interconnectedness of all species, we strive for wholeness and toward justice for all beings. We do good work, not just for human, non-human animals, but for ourselves and all of life, knowing that our connection with the more than human world helps us live most fully, deeply, and authentically, end quote. Their president, Reverend John Gibb Millspaw, writes, there is no better place to raise our voices for animals than in our religious communities. Houses of worship, most all of them, are where people go to take seriously the challenging moral questions of our age. Most people believe that animals deserve decent treatment, but don't see how they can apply that conviction to their everyday choices, especially when the animals affected are hidden from view. When we accept people where they are, but nudge them to find ways to live out their own beliefs, we help others put their best spiritual impulses into action. Every single bit of it makes a difference, not only to the animals, but to people who find that they are living with greater integrity. For anyone interested, we encourage you to check out our list of websites, books, and films that delve deeper into vegan living and animal ministry. A link is posted on our website and will be in the newsletter, to a link for the resources. We invite you to lean further into plant-based eating if it calls to you. Perhaps one meal a day or one plant-based day a week to start. See how you feel and how many options there really are, because really we're foodies and we love to eat. With any kind of meal, <clears throat> make eating a spiritual practice of mindfulness and gratitude. Where did your food come from? Who was involved in growing, harvesting, stocking, and preparing it? How can you assist those who are in need of food? There are many ways to deepen one's connection with animals and nature, and they all lend themselves to becoming a meaningful spiritual practice. Some ideas are to support animal rescues, visit an animal sanctuary, volunteer at an animal shelter, volunteer at a, a farm like Hobbs, Hobbs Farm right here in Center Reach, 
join a Community Supported Agriculture Program, or CSA, where you can get fresh local veggies each week, or start your own vegetable garden. Consider what your household skincare and clothing products contain. Look for the Leaping Bunny logo on packages to facilitate your cruelty-free shopping. And if you're interested in trying veganism, Michelle and I are happy to offer ourselves as consultants. We are hoping that with the guidance of the UUAM, we as a green sanctuary will revisit and strengthen the principles of ethical eating and animal safety. Michelle and I are happy to continue this work with you all in the coming months and years. I invite you now to sing along with Daniela and Ariana as they sing and play the hymn that's most requested at every hymn sing, number 1064, Blue Boat Home. Closing words are by Lorelei Greenwood Jones. All of nature is sacred. For the love of all began with the world. All of nature is sacred. Every creature is a thinking, feeling being. We are blessed with wondrous variety. We are part of nature and of every being on the planet. 
What we do to one affects the many. In this web of existence, we are each a strand. Our pushing and pulling moves the fabric of our world. Each bird and insect, each fish and four-legged creature, all are our siblings. Let us treat them as we would one another, with compassion and dignity, with understanding and honor. The love that we show each being radiates outward, a beam of kindness and caring that can be felt with the heart. And in turn, our hearts receive that love from each being and it echoes onward to eternity. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we meet again. Our, ben our benediction is called Dogsology by Reverend Laura Kim Joyner. From all that dwell below the skies, let so songs of hope and faith arise. Let peace, goodwill on earth be sung or barked or howled by every tongue. <laughs>